Hi friends, I'm Father Kerry Walters, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one, the fourth in a five-part special series on the documents, teachings, and legacy of Vatican II. You may recall that in our first video in this series, we took a long look at the document uh, that came out of Vatican II entitled Sacramentum Concilium. And in that particular document, what the church wanted to do was to revitalize the sacraments in general and the sacrament of the Eucharist in particular. Wanted to, if you will, retain their traditional and important core meanings, but also reform them in order to make them more of a living, vibrant uh, experience for worshipers today. In the second part of this series, we took a look at the Vatican II document entitled Dei Verbum, um, the Word of the Lord. And it is a document about revelation that told us that revelation on the one hand and authority on the other um, both spring from the same source and should be taken seriously. Um, and what we discovered there is that the purpose and hope of this particular document was to encourage all of the people to God to enter ever more deeply into sacred scripture, just as the document uh, Sacramentum Concilium was trying to encourage all of the people of God to enter more experientially and mindfully and purposefully in the sacraments, and particular in the Eucharist. And in the third of this series, we looked at the Vatican II document entitled Lumen Gentium, uh, the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world, but it is the mission of the church to bring that light of the world to the world. And in order to do that, what the fathers in Vatican II took a long, hard look at was the structure and the nature of the church. And they decided that, in point of fact, much more important than the institutional definition of the church is the understanding of the church as the living and breathing body of Christ, which includes all all of the people of God, each with a separate kind of function in the hierarchy of the church, but all of the functions being absolutely important and absolutely essential to the mission of the church to bring Christ as the light of the world to the world. Today we're going to take a look at the document that comes from the Vatican II Council that is entitled Gaudium et Spes, um, Joys and Hopes. It is an exciting document, just as exciting as the other documents. Uh, it is the, I think, 20th century's most profound expression of what you might call Christian humanism. Uh, it is a joy to read, and it is still so very vital and vibrant and relevant to us today uh, in the 21st century. What the church needs to do, so the authors of this particular document insist upon, is to listen and observe the signs and sounds of the time and respond to them in a way that's compatible with the gospel. If the mission of the church is to bring the light of the world, namely Christ, to the world, then what that means is that the church has got to bring a message that incorporates what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a member of a community, and what it means to be a moral person who not only respects the rights and the privileges of others, but who cultivates virtues within herself as well. This particular document, Gaudium et Spes, was uh, ratified and promulgated uh, in the last session of Vatican II in 1965. Curiously and interestingly, it's the only document to come out of Vatican II that was generated within the Council itself. That is, it wasn't the result, the final result of a draft that had been presented before the conference began to the Church Fathers to uh, discuss and debate and uh, eventually codify. This one arose within the conference itself, and it clearly expressed the desire of the members of the Second Vatican Council to make the church more and more uh, a voice in the uh, ongoing uh, cultural debate uh, that was uh, embroiling the world then and that embroils the world now. 
it went through several drafts. Um, and uh, the primary sticking point for some of the fathers at the council was that initial drafts appeared to be just a little bit too optimistic and a little bit too rosy. Those initial drafts, so some detractors felt, tended to uh, skim over, if not outright ignore, uh, the human uh, ability to commit great acts of wickedness and evil, to sin in other words. So by the time the final draft of Gaudium et Spes had been approved by the bishops, this imbalance had been rectified. And so what you notice right away when you begin reading Gaudium et Spes is that it is a, a expression of a tension between um, different polarities. So on the one hand, you have a great deal of hope, that's, of course, part of the title of the document, Spitz. And yet, on the other hand, that hope is uh, juxtaposed and in tension with a certain degree of somberness, uh, a, a sober awareness of the ways in which human beings, through our own sinfulness, can um, destroy uh, or at least mitigate hope. You've also got a tension in this document between, on the one hand, the church and culture between, if I can put it this way, Christian communities and secular culture. Um, both of them have to coexist with one another, and the hope is that they do more than just coexist. What they do is to feed on one another and enrich one another without losing their separate identities. Um, and you've got a third tension, at least a third tension, um, in the document, and that's the tension between permanence on the one hand and change on the other. Um, the church uh, insists that there are certain uh, aspects of the faith which are simply permanent. They are unchanging. They may need to be expressed uh, in certain ways that will speak to each successive generation of believers, but the core of those beliefs, unlike perhaps the expression of them, doesn't change. They are eternal. And yet, on the other hand, we do know that change is a constant, if I can put it that way, in the world in which we live. And what that means is that we are constantly, as Christians, called not only to cope with changing values and norms and mores in the world, to cope with them as um, people who are bringing the light of Christ to the world, but also to a self-examination that periodically uh, asks the question, of what changes within the structure of the church itself uh, needs to be uh, um, considered, needs to be perhaps even uh, undertaken. All three of these tensions, I believe, are so beautifully, beautifully expressed in one of the opening paragraphs of Gaudium et Spes. Let me just read this to you, because it really is um, quite uh, lovely, uh, uh, but also uh, it sets the context for everything that follows. This is in uh, paragraph four of Gaudium et Spes. Never has the human race possessed such an abundance of wealth, resources, and economic power, and yet a large part of the world's population is still racked by hunger and need, and very many are illiterate. There's that hope and that somberness tension, yes? Never has humanity had so intense a feeling for freedom as today, but new forms of social and psychological slavery are on the increase. The world is keenly aware of its unity and interdependence in essential solidarity, while it is seriously polarized by opposing forces. And in fact, bitter political, social, economic, racial, and ideological dissensions remain, together with the risk of a war which will annihilate everything. So you not only have that tension um, um, that I mentioned earlier, but you also see the tension between change and permanence and Christian communities and secular culture being encapsulated in this particular paragraph. Keep in mind the historical context in which this document is born and from which it emerges. The Cold War is at its height. We just had the Cuban Missile Crisis, which has uh, apparently brought the world to uh, a hot nuclear war. Um, imperialism in the Third World is on the way out and has left a horrible vacuum of poverty and illiteracy and exploitation and violence in its wake. Um, the world uh, is 
beginning to see the vast distinction, uh, economically speaking, between haves and have-nots, a, a gap that has continued to uh, exist into our own day. And, and so the fathers, recognizing all of these tensions, really do want to find a way to speak to them in such a way that the gospel message is not only carried to the entire world, but is uh, inspiring uh, some kind of change, some kind of swerve toward justice. As Martin Luther King Jr. once famously said, um, the arc of justice may bend slowly, but it does bend. It does have a purpose and a direction. And I believe that the fathers of Vatican II, uh, the authors of this particular document, Gaudium et Spes, uh, truly did believe that as well. So the document itself is divided into two parts. One part speaks about the dignity of humanity. It's the part that really focuses upon uh, a Christian humanistic perspective. And the second part deals with several specific topics that were on the Father's minds during Vatican II Council, and that still remain topics that ought to be considered by Christians. Um, they include the uh, uh, relationship that we call marriage between individuals, uh, economic justice, political justice, um, culture itself, and peace or nonviolence in the world. And each one of those different specific uh, problems, different specific areas need to be approached through the lenses of Christian humanism as outlined in the first part of this document. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks today, this is an incredible text of Christian humanism. And it is a book in and of itself. Gaudium et Spes clocks in at around 37,000 words. It is by far the lengthiest of all of the documents produced by the Vatican II fathers. And it bears, I think, uh, scrutiny and reading and conversation uh, in community. So, what's this jazz about the dignity of the human person? That's why this document is one of Christian humanism, because it wants to focus upon what makes humans worthy of respect, what makes humans worthy of just treatment, of just political and economic and social relationships, what makes marriage between two people um, so inherently valuable, and why is it that peace as opposed to violence is not only pleasing to God, but is also essential for the fulfillment and the well-being of human beings. Well, Gaudium et Spes says this, Human beings possess an inherent dignity because we are made in the image and the likeness of God. We possess within ourselves um, certain uh, dim reflections, but reflections nonetheless of divine qualities, such as rationality uh, and goodness. Uh, and those qualities, even though we can besmirch them through sinful thoughts and actions, uh, nonetheless constitute a certain sort of dignity which we ought to recognize and value in ourselves and recognize and value in others. That's why we can't treat people as objects, because we are made from the sheer vitality that lies behind all of existence. And if we forget that, then we run the risk of becoming subhuman ourselves or treating others in a subhuman kind of way. And the moment we do that, we have ventured away from Jesus's gospel message of freedom, of liberation, and of eternity. So, how do we go about respecting the dignity of human beings as Christians, as followers of Christ? Well, the first thing that we can do, say the fathers in Gaudium et Spes, is to engage in the culture in which we live. Not to separate ourselves from the culture, not to retreat into a kind of monastic seclusion in which we uh, do nothing but univocally condemn the world, saying that we want nothing to do with it, we want to maintain our own purity. 
What we're called to do is to live in the world in which we've been given and to try and bring once again the light of Christ into that world. So what that is going to mean from a concrete, action-specific uh, perspective will differ, of course, in place and context. To engage with the culture means to focus upon the specifics of the culture in which one actually lives and to ask oneself, in what way can the gospel shed light on what's going right and what's going wrong in that particular culture? And consequently, what's my mission? What's my responsibility to the culture in which I find myself? Let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. After Gaudium et Spes was published in 1965, there was a conference of Latin American bishops that took place in Medellin, Colombia. It's known as the Medellin Conference. It occurred in 1968. And in that particular conference, the Latin American bishops, applying the um, provisions of Gaudium et Spes, argued that the culture in which they found themselves, a Latin American culture rife with poverty and political oppression, called the church in that context to try and stand against the um, uh, political uh, juntas that oppressed people and that privileged a handful at the expense of the many. Now, the way in which that opposition would take place would be in keeping with gospel values of compassion and forgiveness and nonviolence. But it would be a firm opposition, the bishops decided, because the only way that human beings can come to live as God wants them to live is if they are free of poverty and political tyranny. That was reaffirmed in the so-called Puebla Conference that took place in 1979. Uh, in Mexico. Um, it was reaffirmed by the writings of Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador, who will be canonized later on this year as a saint of the church. Those are examples in which the um, insistence in Gaudium et Spes that we need to respond to the culture of our times in a way that's appropriate to the gospel that Christ preached uh, can manifest itself, can illustrate itself. In contemporary United States, how might that manifest itself? How might we engage with the culture in order to bring the light of the world to American society? Well, that, of course, is an ongoing conversation, isn't it? But what we certainly would, I think, want to avoid is the polarization that the culture now finds itself in between liberals and, dem and uh, conservatives on the one hand, between Christians and non-Christians, between haves and have-nots. I think all of us can agree that in the last few years, American culture has become so divisive and so uncivil that um, gospel opportunities for reconciliation abound, even though the reconciliation may be much harder now than it ever has been in the past. Respect for the dignity of human beings, respect for their freedom, and respect for individual conscience uh, is what underlies the Christian humanism of God in its space. Uh, the fathers talk at some length about conscience, and it's a discussion I think that is well worth revisiting again and again. Conscience is that faculty on a human's part that allows them to uh, intuit the right or the wrongness of any uh, considered action or piece of behavior. And the church has always held that a person who acts out of conscience is a person who is doing the right thing, uh, even if the, that act of conscience seems to militate against convention. But the rob, and this is something that Gaudium et Spes reminds us of, the rub here is to make sure that the conscience is well informed. Because since we are creatures who are liable to sin and wickedness, we can easily fall into the trap of self-deception or rationalization. And as a consequence, what we think is the call of conscience can be nothing more than the call of self-interest. So one of the ways in which the Christian relies upon his or her conscience in responding to the world in such a way that we respect the dignity of the people in it is to prayerfully 
be mindful of all of the influences upon us that can disguise themselves as the call of conscience. That's a really important thing that we have to keep in mind if we would truly respect, as Christians, the dignity of all human beings. What's the point of all of this? Well, the point of all of this, of course, is to spread the gospel, to spread the good news throughout the world. One of the beautiful things about the documents of Vatican II is that they really are all interlinked, aren't they? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that uh, just as we want to open up the liturgy to all people in order to include the world in a more mindful way, uh, in a, just as we want to recognize all members of the body of Christ, so now we want to recognize the dignity of all human beings and to bring that conviction into the world and to translate it into actions that uh, remind us of the sanctity of marriage and the need for economic and uh, political justice and the need to overcome our tendencies, our sinful tendencies on both the individual and the institutional or systemic level to resort to violence. Uh, the document Gaudium et Spes, I think, sums up this sense of mission really well in paragraph 40. Let me just read it for you. The Church pursues its saving purpose, its mission, not only by communicating divine life to humanity, but also by reflecting the light of that life throughout the world, particularly in healing and ennobling the dignity of the human person strengthening the fabric of human society and investing the daily activity of men and women with a deeper sense and significance. We've already spoken about two of those three purposes, respecting the dignity of human beings, strengthening the fabric of human society, which is a consequence of respecting the dignity. Let me just close by saying a couple of words about the third purpose that the fathers outline in paragraph 40. That is infusing in our daily activity a deeper sense of significance and purpose. There are two different ways to think about what it means to be a human. Or perhaps I should say two different polarities of ways to think about a human being with any number of intermediary ways of thinking. One way is to think of human beings as nothing more than biological creatures who are accidentally born and will at some unspecified time in the future die. That there is no overarching meaning to either human existence or the universe. Uh, that we are not really much different uh, from any other organism that exists on the face of the earth. We may have a greater cognitive capacities, we may have opposable uh, digits, but at the end of the day, uh, we have no more significance uh, in the universe and to the universe than any other organism. That's one way of thinking about us. Now, many people believe that they can get by with that absolute absence of deep purposefulness and deep significance in their lives. But I must tell you, I think that ultimately they're fooling themselves and they will try to find some deeper meaning or purpose uh, willy-nilly if they can't find it embedded in the structure of reality. The other polarity, of course, is the opposite of that, and it's the uh, view that not only Christians hold, but many other people hold as well who subscribe to different religious traditions. And it is the heart of the Christian humanism that God in its space is preaching. It is the assumption that because we are made in the image and the likeness of God, and because all of the universe is created by a God who then declares it good, that our lives are infused with deep, deep meaning that goes way beyond our individual existences, that somehow taps into the meaning that is part and parcel of the universe because the universe is made by a benevolent and providential deity. In acting as Christians in the world, in trying to do something about the different evils that individuals and societies can suffer from. What we want to make sure that we do is not only uh, alleviate as best we can material poverty and political and economic injustice, but what we want to do is to 
revitalize spirits. What we want to do is to somehow help people to recognize that their lives are of deep, deep purpose and significance, and that that deep, deep purpose and significance is there because it taps into the existence of an all-loving, all-powerful, and all-knowing God. That is the ultimate source of all of our joys and all of our hopes, of all of our godium et spes. I'm Father Kerry Walters. This has been the fourth in a five-part series on the documents and teachings and legacy of Vatican II. And we will finish this series by looking at two documents that haven't gotten as much attention as the four constitutional ones that we've covered in the first four segments of this series, but which I think are vitally, vitally important. And then we'll also take a quick look at the legacy of Vatican II. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time.